yeah, I, I sometimes try and cook Russian food, although borscht was a nightmare, but I think that's because I grated the beetroot borscht? at the wrong stage. Borscht soup. So, okay. Beetroot soup. I think I grated the beetroot at the wrong stage. I don't think it should have been that difficult. I didn't... <laughs> grating a beetroot at the right stage okay that's the first of the okay that's really interesting hello there my name is kit rackley my pronouns are they them and this is coffee and geography the aim of the show is to get to know explore and celebrate the diverse and intersectional range of people on this rock we call home and their love and passions of it. We'll find out why guests identify as geographers, and if they don't exactly, we'll have fun exploring all the myriad of ways that connects their life to geography. So, pour your favourite brew, get cosy and listen in. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPot. Off we go. Hello everybody, today I'm joined by someone who says she wonders whether she has a kind of attention span trouble or perhaps greedy for new experiences, maybe a bit of both when it comes to being a guest on this podcast. <laughs> Welcome Dr Jess Tipton. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's absolutely delightful to have you here and um, to introduce you, you have dabbled in life as a musician, Russianist, civil servant and teacher after studying Russian and clarinet. The logical move, of course, was to work at Devra for 10 years. <laughs> she then became a secondary languages teacher while completing a PhD in Russian multilingualism. Oh, I got it first time. Um, <laughs> and was inspired to return to the environmental fold by all the young people desperate to make our planet inhabitable again. And Jess has been setting up environmental networks of students from schools across the UK and will be developing them further as head of youth networks at Global Action Plan. Yes, so congratulations on that new role, Jess. Thank you. Yeah, it's really exciting. And there goes the dog. There goes the dog. Oh, yeah. Right. And we've got a special guest. What's the, what's the dog's name? She's called Poppy, which I think is the most popular dog name. But she <laughs> she came with it. She's pretty much silent, except when I'm doing things like this. So there, there she is. I think she wonders who I'm talking to. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. So yeah, so that was that was uh, Poppy, everybody. Um, Poppy may make an appearance later, may not again, but um, just to let you know, she's very excited about the podcast. That's Absolutely. what it is. Yeah, our first four-legged <laughs> fan. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are called Coffee and Geography, which was based on a Twitter poll. Um, but we don't all drink coffee. Many of my, I've actually had one de- one guest um, who said they drink water and no coffee and tea anymore, which is absolutely fine. Any beverage is fine. But do you have a tea or a coffee in front of you, Jess? Uh, yeah. So I have got in my Russian dog mug. Very nice. I have at the moment. I've got peppermint tea because um, I needed to sort of be calm. And it's actually, <laughs> I don't know. I know you've done a bit of product placement. It's actually <laughs> from Loop. Ooh. Who are ter- the t- firm TerraCycle, who are doing reusable, like deliverable containers that Ooh. they drop off and you collect. Um, nice. But coffee wise, um, I, we just discovered, you know, Whole Earth, who make peanut butter. Oh, yeah, yeah. They've made an actually nice chicory based decaf coffee. Nice. And, but, it, but it's really hard to find, so I haven't got any. So I would have had that, but we've run out and I have to go. It seems to be Holland and Barrett's the only place oh, you wow. can get it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Product placement. There is no sponsorship with this podcast just yet. And the re- the product placement is two reasons, really. One is we are getting our um, you know students who may be listening or teachers who may be listening to get their students investigate the sustainability credentials of who we mentioned. So I, I like to think that more of a case of we're publicly challenging these companies to to give their sustainability credentials but also to give a plug to those who we know are engaged in sustainable practice and yeah and the thing one thing i like about whole earth is um is that they do i would prefer that they only did palm oil free Mm. peanut butter Mm. but at the moment they do both they got the choice but they quite clearly say on their label whole earth peanut butter no palm oil and then right next to on the shelf is whole earth peanut butter and then so it's a step in the right direction whole earth but come on you can do better (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, that's great. Um, we'll get that mapped then. Right. Jess, you are in the kind of Berkshire, West London area, so um, which is a really interesting part of the country because you're right on that kind of rural urban fringe. 
where you've got the busyness of, of London, you know, Heathrow Airport's not too far away. You've got all those reservoirs, which of course feed, ton, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, but of course, you've got this connection with with Russia and, and all the other places that you've you've been to. So where do I start with that? Um, <laughs> okay, you can start with where you are now or maybe lead up to where you are now. But how has your, um, where you've lived and the places that, that you've experienced, how has that formed your identity? Um I seem to be a bit nomadic, but also have some kind of homing instinct. So I guess that fits quite well with with geography. Because mm. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a geographer, and I know that you're reaching out to non geographers. <laughs> uh, so um, because I studied Russian and French, I guess you know you're naturally inclined to go and live in other places and learn about other cultures. So uh, so I did spend my year abroad in Saint Petersburg. So that's a yeah requirement if you do modern languages degree, uh, and then ever since I've sort of been drawn back to Russia and Ukraine and the Baltics, both just to visit and do research and stuff like that. Um, although um, obviously, like I'm trying not to fly, and I haven't flown for leisure for a very long time, and I've only flown for a couple of school trips and. Um, couple of research trips anyway so got to find a way to get there by train or something that doesn't like take forever so that's that's a mission um so and then like where where we've lived been also a bit all over the place so so yeah I grew up in West London and I teach there Mm -hmm. um and we've lived in Norwood Norwood Junction Ascot most of this is to do with work, I think. <laughs> um, then where did we go? Seven Oaks, Glastonbury. Yay! That was <laughs> that was the best place. Absolutely brilliant place to live. Uh, Bristol for my degree, and then North London, Mill Hill, and then back to Ascot, huh. and then teaching in West London. So there's a sort of coming back thing, and then a sort of going away thing, in sort of three-year cycles so what what has stuck with you then as part of your personality? i mean i mean i don't i i don't know the west london kind of berkshire area that well or apparently some of my ancestors are from like the reading area but only mm. yeah we're quite near we're quite near reading yeah so but of course quite quite removed though so what has stuck with like for example you said you went to bristol we went to university is, is there kind of like any aspect of bristol that has kept with you like something you picked up while you were there and it's like you've carried that around with you f- since or when you've been to you know eastern europe and and russia is like anything you've brought back obviously the the, the fact that your interest in russian culture and stuff is one thing Um, i mean bristol i always said when i was at bristol for my uh degree this is where i'd like to live and come back to and loads of us like from my year all different courses wanted to do that um so i and, and i did my phd was at bristol so that did kind of happen although not living there um, we've got family that live there, so we go there quite a lot, and friends. Um, and then, yeah, so, and then living in Glastonbury, that's pretty close to Bristol. So I have a desire to, like, be there, and I have, when I have a big loyalty to it. So when I ever hit, whenever I hear Bristol come up, and so with these networks, um, I've been helping set up. So one is Avon. And there's um, another one in Somerset. And I have a real, like, I really want these networks to be a success because it's such a such a great place to live around there. Um, yeah, and then Russia. Russia, I definitely have a kind of probably a love-hate relationship. I think that's okay. To, <laughs> I think that's okay to say. No one will come and get me. So I, I, I call that my second second homeland, for sure. My second motherland, you know. Um, and... I'm actually not going to be teaching um, languages anymore. I I, oh. I dropped that about three weeks ago because this juggling thing, this multitasking jack of all trades thing, doesn't. It's not really sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I'm going to really, really miss it. Um, I I can't think of anything like tangible from either. It's just a sort of feeling and a draw mm. and a kind of loyalty. Um, but I do. I definitely have the certain things. I mean, I've got loads of stuff from Russia, like like this mug, like the mug, yeah, um, and various bits and pieces. There's vodka over there, although 
one bottle is uh, made in Oxford, actually. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I sometimes try and cook Russian food, although borscht was a nightmare. But I think that's because I grated the beetroot borscht? at the wrong state. Borscht soup. So, okay. Beetroot soup. I think I grated the beetroot at the wrong stage. I don't think it should have been that difficult. I didn't. <laughs> grating a beetroot at the right stage okay that's the first I've ever, okay that's really i think i i think this was a really long time ago and yeah. i think i grated it when it was raw and i think you should do it when it's cooked but that was like carnage and it was really tasty but i said i'm never doing that again oh, i like that oh I, i'm gonna have to make a note of that i need to look that up and and there's just russian stuff everywhere so all over iplayer um all like podcasts um you know, theatres are full of, like, Russian plays. Um, people are really into Russian culture. And I think whenever there's, like, a big... There's political issues with Russia, which are pretty bad right now, mm. um, people get more into the culture and there's sort of soft power going on. I think that's absolutely wonderful having you on because it's it's a nuance which which is really, really um, ignored and missed, you know, with especially, I mean, we're recording this today on just to give everyone, I forgot to give everyone the uh, time check, the 24th <laughs> of June, uh, but probably people are listening to this around about September time. Um, and this is the day after the news that came out about, um, you know, one, one of the Royal Navy ships out in the, uh, Red Sea, a uh, Black Sea, sorry, you know, near Crimea. So, um, and there was that tension between that and the standoff between the Russian military. So, and then all of that kind of, so whenever we think of Russia, we all, that's all we kind of really think about, you know, is is big state centralized communism, you know, military power, hack, you know, alleged influence in, in elections, all that kind of stuff. But we don't think about things like, well, what about the culture? What about what about what the, the people of Russia offer things? You know, the fact that it's a huge country with many different cultures, you know, because <laughs> you can guarantee you that places like Akutsk isn't very much like places in the West, like Moscow, you know, and uh, and whatnot. So, so yeah, that's that's really really fantastic. And I think um, there you go. If you've if you've learned anything alternative about Russia today, everybody, then it's you must grate your beetroot at the correct stage. I, I think. <laughs> also, uh, just on the like diversity of Russia. Mm. So, my one of my favourite facts, and with with um, my students, they did a talk for. Black History Month about race in Russia that was oh. super interesting. It's not looked into that much. Um, but so t even after like collapse of the Soviet Union, end of Russian Empire, still 10% of the Russian population are Muslim. Wow. I think people are quite surprised because they think of Russians as uh, quite sort of xenophobic and white. Um, but it's so much more complicated than that. Yeah. And, you know, you've got so, so such a mixed population because of all the all the countries around and all the, you know, intermarriage. And... Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I mentioned I mentioned Akutsk, which is actually closer to Mongolia than it is to, <laughs> you know, Ukraine, Belarus, or that, much, much closer. So uh, fantastic. Well, I'm going to stick to the, um, the theme of Russia, but kind of bring a bit more of a, a geography kind of activist kind of thing because in in a sense you're you know you're an, you are an activist and we'll talk a bit about later regards to empowering you know young people in particular with environmental issues um but there's this um so what we're going to do we're going to do uh, jog your memory and what this is this this is a little feature where we talk about some person or event in uh geographical history who's made an impact um and because we're just been talking about Russian. We're going to talk about um, Peter Kropotkin. And uh, for five years as a young man in the Russian military, he was actually based in Siberia. And apart from his uh, military duties, he studied animal life, engaged in geographic exploration. And on the basis of his observations, he elaborated a theory on the structural lines of mountain ranges, it helped revise you know, the mapping and the cartography of Eastern Asia. So he did a lot of that stuff. And he actually contributed to the knowledge of the glaciation of Asia and Europe during the Ice Age, which is amazing. But the reason why I kind of want to bring him up is because of his his activism. So he actually lived in exile from Russia for his strong views that there should be decentralized anarchism, you know, and, but he brought science into the reason why this should be the case. And he, he wrote a book called Mutual Aid, which is widely regarded as a masterpiece. I'm kind of ad-libbing here from uh, <laughs> from. Uh, Britannica here and he argued this is really interesting he argued that despite the Darwinian concept of survival of the fittest 
cooperation rather than conflict is the chief factor in the evolution of species, which I find intriguing. Mm. So what we're seeing with environmental activism today, Jess, you know, like uh, calls to defund uh, centralized law enforcement, you know, instinction rebellion, decolonization, all that. Kind of, clearly, this is nothing new because we have this this person here. And I'm not, we're not going to say about the time that he was around because that's what you've got to guess. But so with everybody listening with that back in the back of their mind, what's from your activism and, and your point of view? I mean, you say you're not a geographer, but you certainly, certainly are in the sense that you are very a very concerned environmental activist and you're very, very good at getting students involved. So, so how have you been going about that? What, what's driven you to really take up this cause and get young people involved? So, I mean, I actually did give up on it at one point. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I worked in the department of environment in DEFRA for 10 years on and off. Um, but because of this, like keep trying to juggle lots of things, I, I had a, career break um, to start the PhD and I went on secondment to a charity, one of the Prince's charities for um, children in the arts. It doesn't it's been since disbanded. Mm. Um, but so but you know on and off for 10 years I was moving around DEFRA. So I, I came in not not as a well as a concern put someone very concerned about the planet and I did I actually did my master's dissertation on Russia and the Kyoto Protocol, so oh, Russia and climate change negotiations. So it had always it had always been with me, and obviously I chose chose to write about that. Um, but I was I think I was put into DEFRA, so you you like just apply for you know civil service generally, and I I put on the form it said what do you what do you most care about or something like that, and I think I put climate change. So I was obviously put into Department of Environment. But I went there without that being my kind of training or background. And then I ended up, because you move around a lot, covering marine policy, sustainable farming, EU and international um, policy, uh, what else? Animal disease risk. Nice. <laughs> very, um, very poignant climate nowadays. Cha- yes, climate <laughs> adaptation and agriculture. Um, and ended up on the 25-year environment plan, which is now sort of morphed into the environment bill. So, and that was all different governments. So started off with Labour, then coalition right, my memory's hazy, and then uh, Conservative. So all different ministers. In that time, there were loads of budget cuts. I think the staff at one time was reduced by a third, Mm. and then that happened again. And I left just before... Brexit um, was on the cards, but by coincidence, I mean, that's not why I didn't know that was going to happen. I think there was an assumption it wouldn't actually. Mm. So at the point I left and I had been doing this really interesting PhD, just simply, well, there was, there was a funding opportunity to be on a research project and I was like, Ooh, Russia, France. Great. I'll do that. (laughs) Um, And I was sort of quite into that and was teaching in a school in Somerset um, in a secondary uh, comprehensive in Somerset I was teaching Russian there as like a club which was amazing and teaching at the university as well so I'd actually decided I can't I can't manage this planet business (laughs) we're we're pretty doomed yeah I'm I I don't know how we're gonna get out of this there's not enough resource there's not enough uh, except it wasn't like now this Mm. was pre-Greta pre Fridays for Futures, pre XR. And I thought, oh, I'll go and focus on something else and you know, and work with young people teaching. I, I like it. It's interactive, you get away from a computer. So but actually when I got to school, I think after about a year or two, uh someone went on maternity cover i think this is often the way geography teacher went on maternity cover they needed someone to do the eco committee Ooh. and i was i was i also had suggested for part a partnerships project for environment to be the focus because it's such a great way to bring students from different backgrounds together so this is like west london which is quite a strange place it's everyone's like cheap by jowl um like 
privileged and deprived and very mixed ethnically and linguistically and generationally and everything. So, um, yeah, so originally my kind of idea was, um, and this was Greta, Greta moment as well, students are worried about this and it's, this is a good way to bring them together rather than some kind of contrived project. Yeah, so that's how it started and it's just really evolved. So the eco committee grew from like a handful of students, like five in year 12 to 15 in year 12 and, and then across the entire year. I mean, we're now oversubscribed and I think it's probably 10 to 15 percent are actively in the eco committee. Another lot are doing studying geography so they're doing stuff like that another lot are doing eco stuff through young enterprise or you know epq type things so it's like really permeating the whole school now so i so i sort of ended up in this situation of bringing bringing young people together and and it growing through london because there's definitely a need for students from different backgrounds from different schools to kind of find each other so that they know they're not alone. They're not the only people who care. They might be one person in their school or there might be a whole tribe of them in their school and they can share ideas and network and influence their own schools and influence MPs together because you can't do... I mean, I know Greta's done a lot on her own, but nobody should be doing this on their own. No, and this is a perfect time, of course, to give a shout out to the um, you know the London Nico Network folks that you're a part of and that that's kind of... you've fed into which is absolutely amazing and you know well just before we start recording you know we actually just naturally because we we've worked together a fair bit on on stuff like this we just naturally like started talking collaborating just instinctively and naturally didn't we about potential things that we might get up to later but if us adults do that anyway and naturally and organically then why can't we empower our kids to do it and also it's not just it's not just helping to face issues you know like environment issues and climate change this is also a fantastic character building social skill you know life skills that they're learning about how to interconnect and work with and collaborate with each other and i just think yeah so shout out again to the folks to the the london eco schools network because you are absolutely amazing and you've really empowered so many youngsters and then you're leading by example and and i know actually that 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 eco network isn't just for london because you get so much engagement from schools and kids from all over the country which is fantastic and i know that you as a network were a big big part of um global action plans youth climate summit last november which which is all the resources from that are free to look at so absolutely yeah shout out for the youth climate summit yeah and so yeah the london schools eco network it's now like across a lot of schools in london it's just spread and um the idea now is with my role that i can be a bit more strategic and like um reach out to other schools that aren't already on board and yeah we've and that model for london has now been um sort of replicated but in a bespoke way like all over and i'm getting emails like every week from different groups so we've now got at least seven and a lot more in the pipeline yeah um with with staff and student and and and, i mean the thing about it is everyone's doing this voluntarily which is great and wrong (laughs) (laughs) um so you know all the meetings are after school in the evenings um after they've done all their school work and you know it's amazing and then the teachers are all not just teachers school staff in general and freelancers and you know people like yourselves are like contributing um in their own time primarily or they might have a notional role but this is so much work that yeah, yeah. so and so i think like one of our um, I know I, I'm not using this as a platform, but I think one of the <laughs> important things is um, to to for these networks, these students together, and the staff to say this: these have got to be properly recognised roles. This has got to be in the Definitely. curriculum. It's got to, every school's got to be signed up to Let's Go Zero and have a sustainability strategy. Because this, as the kids have said to me, this is not a club. We do have fun and we develop all these skills. Uh, and we get to meet each other, but this is not like I don't know, chess club, or um, <laughs> you know, 
playing hockey or something. It's it's work. It's work. Yeah, there's there's stakes involved. There's stakes involved. Yeah. They're, they're invested in it, and and this is the whole thing. It's it's. You're right. It's all about empowerment. And the reason why you're getting such purchase, even though it's voluntary, is because because the way that, that you and the, and the network have been doing it is that the students feel empowered and they, and they have a sense of ownership on it. And one thing, and again, everybody, I'll, I'll, you know, no, Jess, don't ever apologize for, for platforming because because there are there are people listening to this for leisure. But hey, if we can give them some ideas and that, that, you know, that they want, you know, like if they're in a school in London, they can mm-hmm. now get in touch with you or something like that, or if, or they might want to set up something themselves. We've given them a bit of inspiration as well as getting to know you as a person. I just think it's why not? It's a win-win. So yeah, don't ever apologize for platforming. And um, <laughs> it's a very important issue, which is of course, um, it it's, um, encompasses all of our lives in some way, we just can't get away from it. So looping now back to, uh, you know, to our Russian friend, uh, Peter <laughs> Kropotkin. It just goes to show that he is an example that what we're doing today, all of this activism, all of this, you know, dissent, if you so, if some people so wish to call it, is not new. It's nothing new. It's nothing new at all. And actually, people who care about the environment and are jog for stuff like that are usually quite core to some of these movements, especially, you know, when it comes to environmental degradation, and taking care of the land and stuff like that. And of course, we know that indigenous populations all around the world have been doing this for generations generations it's not new at all and of course the way it gets framed by certain uh, powers that be and the media stuff kind of attempt to change the narrative but the fundamental question we've got to ask us uh, ask each other is before you judge people like this is why are we doing it why are we doing it that's the question so before you say you know they should they shouldn't be chained them you know greenpeace shouldn't be chained themselves to an oil rig or something like that you've got to ask the, got to ask the question okay maybe you wouldn't do that but why are they doing that you might not agree with their methods, but why are they doing that? So Peter got in so much trouble with the Russian government that he was almost, he was arrested actually uh, by a police dragnet, but he managed to escape prison and then he went into exile. So uh, because of his, he was seen as a dissident, you know, because he was, he was um, going for uh, basically anarchy, you know, no centralized government, all that kind of stuff. So my question to you then, uh, Jess, have a little guess. So you might not know nothing at all about Peter or something, but um, give us a, a ballpark guess. When do you think um, Mr. Kropotkin was in exile? You can give me a decade or a period of time. It's not a problem. It's, it's, it's not, there's okay, no... Okay, uh... so I'll, I'll show my workings. I'll show my Go workings. ahead, I'll show your workings. So, so my period, so when I was looking at multilingualism in Russia, um, that was the 18th and going into the middle of the 19th century. Okay. So he, di- I mean, I've heard of him, but he didn't come up then. So therefore, I'm assuming, unless there's like a massive gap, which maybe there is, he's after that. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, it, he he's probably one of the ones, um, what, well, he, he's probably, I mean, they were mostly nobles um, because, I mean, literacy at that time was so so low so unbelievably mm. low until you know 1917 the revolution so it was it was mostly nobles who've maybe like traveled abroad a bit done a lot of reading and were getting together and just talking about things so he's probably one of them so pre pre-revolutionary this is this is fantastic reasoning <laughs> keep going uh and yeah and the the czarist government was exiling people all the time so i teach um i've been teaching pushkin Okay. Um, the, the Russian poet, you know, Russian equivalent of Shakespeare, um, to year 12s this year. And he was constantly in exile. I mean, we, he, he, so he, was, he died in his 30s in a duel, and he was in exile for nearly all of his life for one reason or another. Oh, goodness. Um, sometimes it was like house exile. Uh, he never ended up in Siberia. And bizarrely, the book we were studying, so Queen of Spades, we were studying it during lockdown in the pandemic and he wrote it when he was in a lockdown because of a cholera outbreak oh, epi- epidemic in Russia. And he had to, so that was a different type of exile. He had to stay where he was. Um, so yeah, so I'd say it's sort of um, late 19th century um, going into the, so before like 1905, that revolution. So Jess, <laughs> He was in exile between 1876 and 1917. So you're pretty much ah, spot on. Okay. 
it not too bad that's such no, a long time no that's great such a long time yeah he was in exile for a very very long time and um yeah he actually was an aide to alexander the mm. second at one point so you were right to talk about that and he is the son of a prince so um so you all of that reasoning was was absolutely spot on but he spent a lot of time in in switzerland france and here in the uk as well so uh, while he was in exile so um yeah very interesting person so he was just they were just trying to keep him away away from influencing other russians by the basically yeah. yeah and um i mean I, ha I i didn't read too much about what happened to him after he turned after exile but apparently he was uh he was shunned from the anarchist movement like um, after that, maybe there was, you know, because every single, I, you know, idealism has its own subsets and sub of how you should approach it. I mean, you say the word communism and then everybody like goes and cowers in fears because they just think of like Russian big party communism, centralized communism, whereas they don't think about things like um, communism in the form of maybe how some indigenous, po small indigenous populations do in certain parts of the world. But the word communism, of course, is dirty because of all of the history that's been portrayed because of it. And I guess that anarchism is the same. Anarchy, you just think of people throwing, sorry to go Russian again, Molotov cocktails all over the place. <laughs> you know, that's anarchy, you know, smashing things up. Well, no, it's, it's actually basically self-governance, you know, without any influence from the top down. So, but we have a dirty word for anarchy because we use it to describe rioters and things like that so yeah um but that's but language and stuff you can come back later on we can talk <laughs> about that's uh, brilliant but yeah so there you go well done it's spot on um good stuff right so we'll come back to you personally now to time to uh here comes the pun time to spill the beans yes <laughs> yeah so scary. it sounds a bit scary no, no, you're going to tell people because this is basically it's something that people who know you might not know about you, but you're happy to disclose. And that is that you used to play in a classical woodwind trio. So what? So you said you played the clarinet. Was there any other instrument you played or was it just the clarinet or? Piano. Ooh. Yeah, piano and yeah, clarinet. So yeah, it goes back to Russia again. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I always did a lot of music at school like a lot of, sort of little little girls and um started clarinet at primary school because um my teacher was was the, the classroom teacher was like the music man <laughs> <laughs> and um so i did recorder and all that sort of thing and then he had a clarinet in his loft it was one of those stories actually true uh, that i borrowed and he sort of dabbled in teaching me anyway and i sort of took to that and so I did that all the way through school, wondered about going to music college, but I was told that um, you should probably only do that if you feel that's the only option, like you've got such a burning desire that mm. you will kind of die if you don't go and do it. And I thought, well, that's probably not the case. <laughs> so hence I did languages. Anyway, for my year abroad, when I was in St. Petersburg, um, I studied clarinet at the conservatoire, nice. um, which just because I thought, why not, really? It's um, a fun way to get to know people, like in an authentic way, rather than going to study Russian in a university or something, um, which was an absolutely amazing experience. I was the only girl studying clarinet um, really? in the whole of the conservatoire. Yeah. Whereas over here, it's seen as a... Uh, yeah, don't, we're not going to go into gender identity with <laughs> no, me, no. crikey! But but over here, it is seen as a as a girl's instrument, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, crazy enough, I I really yeah, I, I remember doing being in the recorder class, and I, but I really really loved the sound of the clarinet, and I really wish I was picked that up. It's, it's yeah, it's a good instrument. It's so versatile, yeah. and you can do all that different soft genres. sound is just so yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it can come yeah. yeah from literally from nowhere, and like a massive range. Yeah. So, so you were the amazing. only girl at this conservatoire. Yeah, is... and they were a bit suspicious at first, um, <laughs> but sort of won them over because eventually the te the teacher was really cool. Actually, he's dead now, but he was the principal clarinet that did all the first performances of Shostakovich. Um, symphonies in well when it was Leningrad so yeah the whole thing was fascinating and all the lessons so your lessons here would be one-to-one -one, but there it's all like master classes so every lesson like all these 
lads would be crowded round the... Uh, they'd have two grand pianos in every little room, no shortage of pianos, and they'd be there, like, watching your lesson. So it was... A, huh. it, yeah, you had... Yeah, it was kind of do or die, really. Um, so, yeah, that was a great year. And then when I came back from... Uh, sorry, when I finished my degree, I went and um, went to the Royal Academy of Music in London to carry on doing the clarinet. Uh, like I said, I think I'm definitely some attention span thing or like, yeah, agreed for like, there's all this stuff you can do, so I want to yeah. do it all, but there's only one life, so I want to do them all simultaneously. It's not, not really um, possible. Um, anyway, and while I was at the academy, I, I uh, formed a trio. So oboe, clarinet, bassoon. <laughs> and for about 10 years... Um, while at DEFRA, I went around with them doing gigs, so playing at like weird music societies in the middle of nowhere and playing on cruises, saga cruises. There's a good geography link. Yeah, we went all over on these cruises and uh, weddings. Yeah, sometimes like two two gigs a week. It was exhausting. Um, yeah, and then I, I sort of, I, I kind of had to give it up really because we moved to Somerset and they, it was all, they were based in London. But yeah, I miss it. I've got a nice little album, photo album they got printed with all our, all our trips and things in which I, I really like looking at. <laughs> you don't happen to have any audio at all to share, like any oh, recording God. anyway? Uh, there's, a, there's a website. I've been kind of erased Soviet style from it. There's just one <laughs> photo that, so they replaced me like pretty rapidly, um, which I was a bit upset about. Um, but no, no, it's all good. It's good. It's good. They carried on. Uh, so they, it still exists. So it's called the Marlebone Trio. The Marlebone Trio. Right. Because Royal Academy is on Marlebone, uh, uh, near Marlebone High Street, that Marlebone Road, whatever it's called. And we actually played at the opening for a new Chilterns railway line at Marlebone Station because of our name. Anyway, there's a there's a website and there's some clips on there. They're mostly not me. Aww. And the only photo I'm on anymore, I think, is there's a picture of outreach work. Okay. I'm just looking it up now. The yeah. To do. There, there, I'm under education work. Okay. And that's outreach, that's yeah. me on the right with our Marlebone Trio... Marlebone tube station t-shirts nice there we you are yep. of, we had sort of uniforms with a bunch of uh those school kids there and their blue little jumpers listening very intensively yeah but other than that i'm i might be on some of the tracks under listen but i'm not going to advise anyone to listen to that oh <laughs> listeners if you like <laughs> like this kind of music classical woodwind music there you go we'll put the link to that in the description you can have a little listen to there is jazzy stuff yeah. Uh, particularly, I used to get to do the jazzy bits, and one of we used to play a solo each in the concerts to break it up. And I used to play um, some Gershwin sometimes. Nice. When anyone, anyone someone says jazz, <laughs> I, I I like to lean into my podcast mic and just do that whole jazz, <laughs> jazz. And here, very nice. We have Jess on the clarinet. Nice. We we should have had you to compare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i feel like i'd be i'd be like that that person on the first show like just well we needed i think we needed a fourth party sometimes it got a bit intense <laughs> <laughs> oh cool right that's wonderful um so where did we move on from there that's just brilliant yeah i was i, I do uh I, it's so, so it's a bit bittersweet mentioning this but uh, i don't know if i've mentioned it on the podcast before but i actually played a saxophone or used to play the saxophone oh. Yeah, I've got it upstairs, in, but this sums it up, really. I've got it upstairs in my loft. <laughs> um, such a shame. I used to play, I, I've got a grade, oh, what, what grade did I get up to? I think I got up to grade three, I think. So I was which, pretty decent. What type is it? Which saxophone? Tenor saxophone. Tenor sax. Yeah, tenor saxophone, which was, when I first started, it was, was almost the size of me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had, I had, um, I, I've, I've never not heard from him since I was a sixth former, but I had a wonderful teacher called Dave Diamond. Classic, what a, what good, a, what a classical name. name for it yeah for a music teacher um and yeah he was um uh, a lovely guy and he taught and we used to the best parts of the music lessons for me was when we just improvised and just riffed off it so so we would pick a key uh or a chord and then we'd just go for it 
and that was like some of the best of and then we would just jam for like just 10 minutes i'm so impressed because i can't really play by ear i can just sight read but yeah i don't know how people do that the really weird thing is there's quite a famous saxophonist called gerard mccrystal uh-huh. so you yeah. you had david diamond gerard mccrystal huh. i'm gonna have to see, right I'm, I'm definitely not gonna go all stalker but i'm gonna see if um Oh, you're going to see if, see if, if he's uh, yeah. What's happening? Well, yeah, he was it was fantastic. Yeah, and I tell you, he, he really and then went. I he then um, stopped teaching the classes because I think he moved away or something like that. And uh, yeah, and I just lost interest after that. Uh, went you know, I took it to university with me. I went the you know UEA took UEA, but I, I with the intention of continuing to go. And I went to a couple of jazz classes, but then it just fizzled out. You know, other things took over. You know, as you like you, you know, things you want to do everything, bits of everything, and it just dropped from there. So. He's not this. There's quite a well-known composer by the look of it. He's American, though. No, he's David not American. Diamond. That's a weird coincidence. Yeah, no, I don't think that'd be. But anyway, in the rare, 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 <laughs> rare, 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 rare chance that David, you know, you used to teach uh, music lessons in Harlow and Essex back in the late nineties, early two thousands. Get in contact. <laughs> Let me know. Shout out. <laughs> There's a shout out. <laughs> Yeah, crikey. Well, I wasn't expecting that memory to be brought up. Right. Uh, Jess, we're coming to the end of our chat now, which is um, which is a big, big, big shame. Um, but we have, do have to do one last thing, and that is at the end of every episode, we like to connect each of our guests together by doing something. We are all geographers, and I know that you're, you're aware of this because you've... Uh, you liked a tweet with the the word cloud that all of these words are forming and a beautiful word cloud it is. Please check that on the Coffee Jog Pod Twitter account, everybody. Now, I had um, the wonderful Justin Boot speak to me last week. Um, they were absolutely fabulous guests, someone in, Cal- in California, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And when I asked Justin to come up with a word for you to try and link to geography or to link to the environment or nature or whatever it is, they came up with the word elusive. Oh, God. Elusive, yeah. Um, and I tell you what, the words of late have been quite abstract. <laughs> just just to clarify, so as in E-L-U-S-I-V. Right. Well, this is it. And, and I do apologise, Justin, if you're listening <laughs> to this. If I, I did listen back to the recording with Justin a few times just to double check. Did, just, did they say elusive or elusive? But I, I said elusive after they did. And they didn't correct me. So I think it is elusive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Have a little think while I set up the timer for you, because there is a oh, 30 how long second do timer. I have? 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Okay. Just, basically, you just, you just talk as much as you can about the word elusive. Oh, yeah. As much like as you like can. That, that radio thing. Just a minute. That's the one. Oh, God. I'm really bad at this sort of thing, by the way. I can play articulate, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You just tell me when you're okay. ready. Okay. Okay, go for it. Okay, well, I think the thing about nature is that you can't, lots of people can't quite define what it means to them. So you don't know where your love or even hatred of it comes from. So it can be from like pre verbal, like when you're a tiny little kid, some kind of experience, like being immersed in it or not experiencing it. So that makes it elusive. You can't quite put your finger on it. You can't quite convey to people why it's so important. That's not bad. <laughs> nice one, Jess. That was hard. <sighs> Justin, I, I have to say, that Justin. Was hard. Yeah, you came up with a fantastic word there. Yeah, I mean, uh, elusive. But yeah, that's right. I mean, it's there's so much about, also, there's so much about nature and environment and everything which is unseen. Mm-hmm. You know, and the the connections, the connections that we're all a part of. I mean, as, as we know, uh, Jess, because because of the kind of activism work that we do, is like this this lack of connection between human and and the environment, humans and the environment and nature, means that you know it, it it's it's quite elusive in the fact of trying to get that message across mm. that we do need to protect the environment because in the end of the day we will be destroying ourselves, mm. not just the environment. You know, and you know the current situation with coronavirus is is a derivative of environmental degradation because it's a, it allows disease to foster and and stuff like that and i think our well-being you know it'll be uh, we will not be able to find our positive well-being it'll be quite elusive if we don't look after the environment <laughs> and and then um yeah so it, it, that was a hard one that was a hard one but yeah, you definitely got you. a connection uh, there who was it who did that come from yeah ju- they uh, justin yeah they thank they gave you, you the word elusive yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
No, good stuff, Justin. Um, right. So, but the good thing is, is that you, well, you don't get your event revenge back on Justin, but you do get to um, challenge the next guest. So you get to come up with a word of your choice or a topic of your choice that the next guest has to try and link to geography. So I'm finding that I'm looking around. Everything I think of is like obviously to do with geography, which I guess <laughs> is the point because it's everywhere. Um, so I think um, I'm looking at our keyboard here. I'll, I'll try music. Music. Okay, lovely. Because that links back with quite a lot of what we've been talking about. Can't do Russia. I mean, that's that's no, <laughs> that's no good at all. But maybe music. Well, we've we've had we've had words like discombobulated. We've oh, had wow. embodiment. We've had elusive. So now we're bringing well, it mine's back. Mine's a bit more, yeah, a bit more. We're bringing it back down to earth, excuse prosaic. the pun. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's great. But it's music. not. Music is elusive. It's not. What is it? Yeah, perfect. What is music? Yeah. Now, the best thing about the We Are All Geographers thing, it's not just the challenge of trying to link its geography. It's the challenge of trying to th- trying to choose which way it yeah. links to geography and music. There are so many different ways you can approach that. So it'll be interesting to see what the next guest comes up with. I can think of something, but I won't say it. <laughs> so, Jess, um, chance we've already given some shout outs already to like the uh, London Eco Schools Network and the um, the uh, the people who you know from your old group who've erased you, you know the Marlebone <laughs> uh, trio. <laughs> but no, hi everybody. Is there anyone else you'd like to say hi to? Um, just I probably should say it's the London Schools. London Schools Eco Network, not the London's Eco Network. Schools Network. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we've had we've had trouble with that, but yeah, because to differentiate from the Eco Schools program, of which course. obviously all the schools do, and we promote, and we're connected with them. Yep, thank you for that correction. So those guys, and then there's networks in. I'll quickly rattle them off. Go for it. Berkshire, the Midlands, Avon, Surrey, Somerset, Buckinghamshire, just setting up, and then I'm talking to folks in lots of other places. Um, then we've got a UK schools sustainability network mm-hmm. that brings them all together. And we've got um, lots of exciting plans coming up for COP26. Uh, website will be uh, launched quite soon for that. Uh, and there is a Twitter account, UK Schools Susty. And then there's Twitter and Instagram for all those different regional networks, uh, awesome. often run by the students. Uh, Global Action Plan. Of course, Hi, the folks. charity where I uh, now work, as you said, and their schools program, which is called Transform Our World. Just stick that into Ecosia. <laughs> the, yep, Ecosia, the web browser. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and we're we're really excited. We're doing a webinar this evening with Project Drawdown. Yes. The big climate solutions people in the US, which really exciting. Yeah, and let's give a shout out to uh, to Chad Frischman because um, yes. I met I met Chad when I ran a conference for climate and energy scientists in in Co- in uh, just outside of Copenhagen um, in 2019. So yeah, so Jess, you can say yeah. uh, say to Chad, say uh, Kit sends their regards. And will do. Yeah, and absolutely. Lily Platt. Lily, Lily Platt, Platt as well. Oh, bless Lily. Yeah, be there as well. Yeah, and just thank you to all the staff, all the students who are doing this all in their spare time. Absolutely. It's loads of hard work, but it's definitely worth it and everybody when when jess gave that list of um counties and regions you know if you heard yours try you know find out about it get involved join up if you didn't hear yours consider thinking starting one up like i norfolk and suffolk i didn't hear your name i didn't no, hear your name so no, they are i'm not of a gap. and i'm yeah. gonna step back i'm not gonna try and set up something else <laughs> i want someone else to do that one uh yeah, i'm already doing enough as it is oh ireland i forgot ireland, There's ireland. ireland as well yes yeah. Good. So get and, involved. And check out check out the previous Youth Climate Summit. Yes. Including um, your brilliant poem. Oh bless. Yeah. That you performed. That was loads of fun. Yeah. <laughs> right. And what about yourself though? So if people want to connect with you, how do they fo- find you on Twitter? So I am. I think I'm Doctor Jess T underscore Eco. That sounds about right. Oh, and I'm on LinkedIn, which I quite like. It's a bit calmer. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter, you're like, oh, I've got to keep up. Yeah, it's very ephemeral, Twitter. It's like um, trying to chase yes, after exactly. a, a train of t- tweets that kind of run away from you. Right, okay, Jess, this was loads of fun. Thank you so, so much. And I've learned I've learned more about you that I didn't realise, which is uh, fantastic. Always nice when someone you know tells you something you didn't know. So. <laughs> well, thank you. I really, really enjoyed that. And I shall check out um, Kropotkin. Yeah. So yeah. many interesting Russians. Thank you very much, Jess. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you had fun. 
If you haven't already done so, please subscribe so more stories and experiences can drop into your favourite podcast app. If you fancy being a guest or have any feedback, follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPod and send us a DM. Or you could email coffeeandjog at geogramblings.com. Until next time, keep geogging. Just been talking about Russian. We're going to talk about um, Peter Kropot- Kropotin. Kropotin? Kropotkin. Go. I'll leave it out. <laughs> Peter Kropotkin. And uh, he was, um, for five years actually, a young man in the Russian military army uh, based in Siberia. But what he did, not just his military duties, he was also, he studied animal life, he engaged in geographical explanation. Goodness me, Kit. <laughs>